Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the afternoon of Automotive Logistics Mexico 2016. I hope that you had a, a good lunch that was hosted by our good friends at Ryder, but I hope you didn't have too good a lunch because we need you to be wide awake and ready to ask lots of questions. I think the morning gave us a lot of information, a lot of food for thought, uh, perhaps high level, a bit strategic, we're going to start digging down a little bit deeper in more practical uh, and bringing some of the actual operational stuff uh, to the conference now as well. I will, re will remind any latecomers to the conference, the, the presentations and the questions from the audience can be in Spanish or English. So if you need to collect a, a translation headset, uh, they're, they're available outside. The format will be the usual, where the presenters make their presentations all in a row, and then we save the, the questions and answers to the end. We don't hand out the presentations during the conference, but at the end of the conference, we will make many of the pre presentations available. We'll send you a link to them at the end of the conference, then you can uh, view the presentations or download them, uh, so you can you know, revisit some of the information again. And of course, the, the whole conference is being streamed live across the world. So uh, if you have any relatives anywhere around the world, uh, at any t time during the conference, you can stand up and wave uh, and they can see you. This afternoon, we're looking at um, Mexico and the rest of the world. So we're attracting uh, logistics and automotive to Mexico. Mexico is part of a global supply chain. Uh, the international world, I, I suppose logistics, by its very nature, is, is international. So that's what we're going to be focusing on a little bit today, this afternoon. We're very fortunate to have a fantastic panel that includes uh, uh, a Mexican state, Jalisco, that, has, uh, that is attracting and, and pushing to develop its automotive business and its automotive cluster. Uh, we have the, the Mexican Institute of Transportation and also the head of the Mexican Automotive, uh, Mexican Logistics Association represented. Then we have Ford of, Ford of Mexico, the car maker, and then Goodpack, uh, the, uh, a logistics service provider. So without any further, further ado, I'd like to welcome to the, uh, to the podium the first speaker of this afternoon, uh, Mr. Ruben uh, Resendez uh, Perez, the Director, and General, Director General of Jaltrade from the state of Jalisco. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a briefly presentation from Jalisco State. It's in English, but uh, I was working many years in Japanese company. My pronunciation some is uh, not too bad. It's terrible <laughs> because because uh, I have a Japanese English. <laughs> So sorry, I prefer to speak in Spanish, but the presentation is in, in English, and no, no, no problem for, about that. that. Uh, Jalisco, uh, delay for a star business in automotive uh, sector. With this new government, with uh, Aristoteles Sandoval, is a new governor, uh, he's working very strong to attract uh, auto parts investment, especially. Entonces, esta es la presentación. Uh, this is my presentation. Jalisco's population is made up. No, Mexico's population 120 million. Jalisco 7.9 million. Population is concentrated in the metropolitan area of Guadalajara. We're talking about 4 million people in the metropolitan area. In economical terms, we have interesting foreign investment. Last year, the forecasted 
amount of foreign investment was exceeded. We ranked fourth in the country with 1.9 billion dollars. Our situation is different from the rest of the world because we had a th the world had a 3.5 reduction but we had a 3.6 increase in growth. We export 7 111 products. Exports are diversified, especially when it comes to manufacture and to agro industry. It has major representation in terms of exports. We do not only depend on a couple of products. These are the top sectors manufacture, food, agriculture, beverages. There has been interesting growth. Jalisco has large food and beverage production. We don't only export to the United States, but to Europe, Asia, and more especially to Latin America. This is our the growth of foreign investment in the last couple of years, foreign investment has grown, especially when it comes to high-tech companies. As you know, Jalisco, and especially the area of Guadalajara, is the Mexican Silicon Valley. We have been able to draw high-tech companies. That's the investment up to the third quarter of 2015, 1,907. This is our international trade, imports, exports. We have those $37 billion of exports against 40 billion for imports. There was interesting recovery in terms of employment. An 81,973 increase. We have an upward trend stemmed out of all of the companies that have just arrived to Jalisco. We have world-class labor, which has made it possible to work with other companies. We also have a high availability of engineers. Universities have aimed at developing engineers for the high-tech industry. There is expertise among electronics, telecom sector, automotive sector, but there are also a few of them in the airspace sector. We have not had union issues in the past 10 years in Jalisco. We have outstanding universities, the Autonomous University of Guadalajara, ITESO. Of course, we have the University of Guadalajara. It is one of Mexico's top universities. Unfortunately, we have not been able to attract a part of the University of Mexico, UNAM, National Autonomous University of Mexico, has not does not yet have a campus in Jalisco, but we expect that situation will change in the near future. We have 147 technical institutions, postgraduate institutions, training centers, as well as technical schools. We are connected 
with the rest of the country in a wonderful way. We control exports and imports from the port of Manzanillo, which allows us to have connection with the north of the country. We have a great road and highway infrastructure. The port of Manzanillo, as I already mentioned, is nearby. It, we, there is a distance of 296 kilometers that separates us from Manzanillo, where product and raw material are brought to the central area, the Bajio area of Mexico. You, as logistics exports, know that the port of Manzanillo has welcomed investment for expansion. Nevertheless, it is overwhelmed now. It takes containers eight or nine days until they are able to leave. We need to acknowledge that we do have an issue, but this problem, we need to s work it out in order to improve competitiveness. Railroads. Ferramex has the concession in this area of the country. It's the only railroad we have in the area. The train connects us directly to Manzanillo. It connects Manzanillo to downtown Guadalajara. But it also connects us with the northern area of the country through the borders of Nogales, Piedras Negras, and Ciudad Juarez. Of course, there's also connectivity towards the central region of the country. We have two international airports. We have the Puerto Vallarta Airport, International Airport, and the airport of Guadalajara is the second largest airport in the country. The reason is because we have high-tech companies and we have now direct connections with Asian cities. There are three direct flights a week to Asia. Uh, to Asia, we also have a Guadalajara Frankfurt flight, and we have many flights heading to Southern Asia. In addition to connections with U.S. major cities. In 2014, we don't have 2015 Im information of 2015, but we do know that there was growth. These are our direct flights, Europe, Asia, Southern Asia bound. Jalisco is innovation. This is mine. Mine, mine is a building that holds trade chambers of the state of Guadalajara, uh, state of Jalisco, as well as research centers. We're also working on the digital creative city. highly related to high tech, the high tech industry. We have Continental Research and Innovation Center. We have a design center from Intel. We have Frescale, which has an electronic design center. We have Bosch, Hella, also launched their automotive design center through the creation of an innovation and competitive n culture institution. The former chair of Hewlett Packard, he, he used to be VP, global VP, and he is now involved in the creation of this innovation and creativity 
institution. We have over 6,000 hotel rooms, high touristic development, not only, we don't only have beaches, we have forests. Many of our cities are now called magical towns. We have recreational, commercial centers, cultural activities. We have great restaurants, high quality medical services. They are also involved in medical tourism and we have visitors who come to the, our hospitals to treat themselves. We have convention centers with large capacities such as Expo Guadalajara. We have beautiful golf courses, 48 industrial parks, three technological parks, one software park, one multimedia park, and we're currently working in a park that is uh, going to be located in Lagos de Moreno, just in the midst of the automotive corridor coming from San Luis Potosí, Aguas Calientes, heading to Aguas Calientes, Silao, Salamanca, and Querétaro. We have worked in order to try to bring tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers from different automotive brands. These companies decided to come to Jalisco their investment has grown in the area. They have generated up to uh, almost 15,000 positions. Perhaps you can't read the map. But around the metropolitan area, as you can see, you can find many companies. These used to be involved in electronics, but they have moved, especially if we consider that vehicles use electronic equipment. These are a few of the auto parts manufactured in the state of Jalisco. I want to go back, but I can't. This is the industrial park in Lagos de Moreno. As you can see, Highway 45 coming from Aguas Calientes comes straight to Guanajuato through Querétaro. We have Highway 80 coming from Guadalajara up to San Luis Potosí and it heads north. As you can see, In logistic terms, this is an extremely appropriate park. Silao has uh, General Motors, Salamanca has Mazda, Celaya has Honda, and the recent announcement from Toyota. San Luis Potosí is pretty near General Motors, the BMW, and there may be another project reaching the San Luis Potosí area. As you can see, in strategic terms, it is extremely well located within logistic corridor with great advantages and opportunities 
in logistic terms. These are the f a few of the incentives that we find in the state of Jalisco. Training programs, infrastructure, land, discount, fiscal incentives as well. We also have municipal incentives. We included municipalities such as Zapopan, Guadalajara, El Salto. But it, we also have the northern area in Lagos de Moreno, that in San Antonio, we have major developments going on. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much uh, for giving us an update on what uh, Jalisco can offer the automotive industry. Uh, one of the things we talked about in the first couple of sessions was the need for uh, education and training of uh, the human resources for the automotive industry. So it's good to see how much emphasis you were putting on uh, the training and technology colleges and, uh, that you had out in Jalisco. Uh, next up to hear perhaps a little bit more about the the logistics and transportation side of, of Mexico. I'd like to welcome to the podium Miguel Gaston Cedillo Campos, the um, senior researcher from the Mexican Institute of Transportation, is just one of his titles. <laughs> so. so, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I, I would like to thank the invitation of Automotive Logistics. Uh, uh, I am very pleased to be here and share with you some uh, experiences uh, related to organis uh, organization of uh, collaborative networks and logistics. So my presentation uh, will be delivered in, uh, in Spanish. So uh, in order to, to provide faster my message. So, Quiero presentarles. I'm going to show you the outcomes of what we have done to analyze supply chain fluidity. Our goal is to try to establish the critical aspects so we can improve performance in the automotive sector, especially because of the amazing growth we are facing and technological changes that will interfere in logistic processes. When we wanted to start with this initiative, we asked ourselves how we could improve supply chain fluidity by also reducing both costs and risks. I will now present you with a few of the results of the project and I am also going to try to understand both the opportunities and challenges we have now to we now have to face together. This presentation will first of all analyze a few critical facts about the industry. We will also try to understand what supply chain fluidity is and we will analyze the challenges posed upon us. I will also try to explain what collective intelligence is because we're trying to build collaboration networks so we can all together have more information to analyze the logistic competitive advantage which is naturally provided by our country but that must also be improved. Definitely we understand logistics is an important element. 
It is not only important for companies, but it is also important for countries. When it comes to countries, it is key to attract and sustain installed investment. For companies, it involves processes organization in order to comply with whatever was promised to end consumers. We are facing a trend which is called near shoring, derived from growing regionalization of world economy. This is a phenomena, phenomena called reverse globalization. Production regionalization throughout the world poses certain advantages to the regions who are now making the decision of improving processes by sharing experiences among companies and the government. We have a f forecast from the U.S. Imports Department that have told us that in five years, the Made in Mexico brand will have increased presence in the U.S. rather than the Made in China brand. Especially, they have considered that it is a great opportunity to integrate local suppliers so companies are supported to grow competitiveness and to increase resilience among supply chain. In a technical report of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, we learned that Mexico is about to reach 22% of U.S. production in LVs, and it will attain it by 2020. The fact is that Mexico is moving from a low cost area and it is now becoming a higher technology environment. Through the different business agreements we have with the different trade agreements, a few companies are not only used for production, but they are also being, been, are being leveraged as a way to reach global markets. So we must not only focus on North America now, but we can expand to other regions. It's the case, for instance, of Volkswagen, who is using Mexico as a platform to send production, to deliver production to other markets around the world. It is important to emphasize that in order to attain fluidity among supply chains, it is also necessary to work in a collaborative fashion so we can be prepared for the next generation change in the automotive industry. That is why the Mexican Institute of Transportation wants to assist the development of distinctive competencies for Mexico-based companies. We definitely know that companies face an uh, incredible amount of risk. This poses an opportunity to tackle change by improving the functioning of supply, the supply chain. So what is fluidity? We need to focus on fluidity and it can be understood as a capability level to continuously achieve a reliable, secure, and accurate flow of processes effectively supporting the supply chain goals. We use this definition as the foundation so we could give, take the first step in our project. In 2013, the Mexican government ordered a study the national system of logistic platforms along with data and analysis developed at the Mexican Institute of Transportation preliminary analysis 
gave results about intermodal corridors so we could identify performance parameters that would also enable us to propose certain improvements. Based upon real cases, we established a methodology that allows to measure fluidity among intermodal corridors. Let me tell you that a few variables such as disruption times generated due to delays or natural disasters and some of the th other things is safety inventories were considered under a mathematic model that is now operative. Nevertheless, the model it will can must not only be used as a proposed methodology, we're already contemplating implementation. In general terms, this method contemplates four KPIs. Travel time, reliability or variability of travel time, cost and risk. Hence, it is possible to assess the difference between available corridors. When it comes to fluidity, it is things become complex and we need to think about collective intelligence, businesses, the academia and the government need to work together. I, the, we tend to take a look at supply chains in a linear way. But studies from the University of Oxford demonstrate how complex they can be. And perhaps for decision-making purposes, we would rather have simplicity. But simplicity or simple solutions won't be real in the future. It is our goal to build a reliable measurement system for supply chains so we will be able to improve parameters and we will provide companies with improved data for decision-making purposes. IMT, the Mexican Institute of Transportation, contains six world-class laboratories. One of them is the National Laboratory of Transportation and Logistics, which is a part of the National Center for Intermodal Transportation and Logistics. This central, the center, contains nine institutions with competencies for data collection and result delivery. I brought a video that will provide further explanation on the center. In este mundo competitivo, to clearly establish a competitive strategy in order to develop a supply chain which allows for differential added value to the consumer is just one of the critical tasks that in real time requires up-to-date knowledge and world-class technology. Latin America is now globally recognized as an emerging region with high potential for the development of innovative transport systems and logistics. Mexico, a logistics flow node point between North America and Latin America, is consolidating itself as a center of knowledge and first-tier tech logistics. The National Center for Innovation in Intermodal Transport and Logistics is a national network center that seeks to promote a ruling between the productive sector and academics. Integrating nine organizations with recognized expertise in research and technology transfer, which together seek to improve the Mexican logistics competitiveness. Among the initiatives being led by Senate Logistics are Conocid National Laboratory in Transport Systems and Logistics, National Freight Transport and Logistics Observatory, National Transport Model, Network Thematic Research in Transport Systems and Logistics, with the aim of maximizing the resources the following goals are sought after. Promote Mexican logistics performance through solid solutions backed by the use of world-class technologies. Generate research that favors the development of distinctive competitive advantages in transportation and logistics systems. Support talented students with their training on real-world project experiences. Pass on research and innovation processes results to affiliated companies. Develop profitable activities based upon the development of potentially patentable products. In this way, we stimulate the innovation process and effectively transfer logistics knowledge to boost national competitiveness.
using world-class standards in research and development. Dynamic alignment of national efforts is favoured in such a way that in 2018, Senate Logistics will be recognised National Network Centre of Excellence. A research facility that fosters an effective link between key players involved in research. Open innovation and technological entrepreneurship in intermodal transportation, logistics and supply chains. Thereby contributing to the transformation of Mexico into a global logistics centre of extra added value. Bueno, como parte de este, de este proyecto, this project, we have also started with the integration of different of technology-based uh, uh, companies, among which we have PTB Group, Macrolink, and of course some other companies or institutions such as uh, Nuevo León uh, University, Yucatan University, and just recently the Tecnológico Monterrey has requested to join our group. There are other logistics and supply chain companies such as the Nuevo León Cluster, Logistics Cluster. This is aligned with what we're currently doing in the states through the federal administration of or the federal management so we can have a nafta fluidity index in this case also canada is currently working on this they are the founders of the fluidity concept and in this case we do consider that working to work together to develop fluidity competitiveness in north america is basic is, is critical because because this allows us to answer to very important questions that you might ask yourselves on a daily basis. How well the nodes work within in the network? Where are the bottlenecks at uh, infrastructure level? And how does the infra infrastructure system react when there are disruptions that will allow us to assess the supply chain uh, efficiency. But I also would like to um, launch a proposal. We need information from you so this becomes a much more robust tool and we can achieve the impact that we have. The conclusion. Current integrated supply chains are agile and cost efficient, but these m make them very highly susceptible to disruptions. It is necessary to establish those uh, risk points so we can provide to those companies working in Mexico the necessary conditions. We have seen that the supply chain fluidity measurement is extremely important for competitiveness. And in North America, we will be able to offer a differentiation versus other uh, regions. In Canada, they, uh, in January in Canada, they started with the National Council in Automotive Logistics, and we are on time to start a project, a similar project in Mexico. So this is all, and I'm f I'll be very gladly answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Gracias, Gastón. Es muy interesante. There's so much happening to, to make sure that logistics and supply chain is at the level that's needed to support the, the growth of the, of the automotive industry in Mexico. And one of the important terms that I think I heard you say in your presentation, collective intelligence. I think that's very important. There's a lot of intelligence in this room, in the whole industries, in the automotive industry, in the logistics in industry, amongst the car makers, the tier suppliers, and of course the logistics providers. But it somehow needs to be collected and shared so that the best solutions are, are found. Uh, next up, um, to get to the actual car makers and to hear what they're doing, particularly on an international perspective, I'd like to welcome a good friend of, uh, of ours and uh, the automotive industries, Rafael Lopez, Material Planning and Logistics Director for Ford Mexico. Thank you, Rafael. Hello, everybody. Luis uh, and Sporson's team, thank you for inviting us to share these talks in this regard. 
I think it's a very important forum. As of to now, I have been learning a lot in this morning. Congratulations, Gaston, for your initiative. I for sure will be, will be in touch to talk in more detail about it. How can, how can, thank you. Uh, este es cómo se mueve la industria en la, la industria automotriz. Industry is moving in, uh, internationally. Here we can see that China, uh, China's uh, share is 25 percent, and in Mexico we have three percent. This three percent of all the world industry is what we uh, sell in the local market, the domestic market. This is an analysis of how the performance of several economies and the conclusion is that there have been dramatic changes recently in the 25 top export economies. Here in green, you can see those that have not changed or that have changed positively and the ones that are in red are those that have changed negatively. These 25, 25 economies have been broken down in 45 different concepts, the ones that have been um, under the stress of different economic factors. We have Brazil, Rus Russia, China, and Poland, and those that have lost terrain regarding competitiveness, those that have traditionally been competitive, but they have lost this competitiveness, uh, competitiveness, those that have uh, been behaving in a very steady way, and the ones that have been rated as rising stars, those that have uh, gained competitiveness and that they have moved favorably in the business world. Compared with some economies with other countries, Mexico and the United States are economies that have experienced very favor favorable changes, favorable changes on wages, salaries, and absolute production. Mexico has gained 53% of productivity. We are comparing the 2004 to 2014 period regarding currency. This minus 11% is larger because of the exchange rate uh, of the peso. And the natural cost has, re has been reduced in Mexico and the power has increased. The power cost has increased in Mexico. So, the, we wonder if the panel is Mexico and the rest of the world, what makes Mexico to be well positioned and what has made the automotive industry to have this boom in Mexico. We are comparing Mexico with seven different countries such as Brazil, Russia, China, Indonesia, Korea and Turkey. We have compared Mexico, the uh, line, uh, the baseline um, is Mexico, and what we are comparing or benchmarking are different factors, the macroeconomic factors, the, uh, the total cost for manufacturing, the domestic market, demography of the country, who lives in this country, how well ed the education of the people in that country, the capability of providing engineering and sp experts, and uh, the government, and the, deve the human development index. If you look at this chart, we are uh, uh, if the green is they are the same as in Mexico on under Mexico baseline is in yellow and the red and the, the red ones are below the line of reference in Mexico in Brazil we have some competitive advantages if we analyze these different 10 factors these are some economic indicators considered to assess the development of that country. We have the GDP, 
the global development product, the exchange rate. Here, the uh, inflation rate and the interest rate. The conclusion of these four different indicators is the uh, environment is politically stable. There are some political reforms that are in process in progress and the indicators are stable. There is a volatility that we are all aware of regarding the exchange rate with the dollar. Uh, the panels, uh, the, uh, the speakers before me have indicated the, the development of the automotive industry because of the treaties uh, or agreements with other countries. We have 13 uh, treaties or agreements with 40 cities, others with Aladi, and other agreements with Asia and Pacific, plus the new ones that are in progress. They were commented by the Ministry of Economy. They were mentioned by the Ministry of Economy. And so all these agreements and the slide that I just showed, it, all the agreements that Mexico has entered into with other countries make it easier to have a good investment environment and an export free of duties. This is a, a forecast of what's going to happen in the future. And this is an analysis made by the HSBC. And here we can compare 2010. Here you can see the GDP measured based on the tri triple pay purchase in power party in uh, millions of dollars and we have the forecast to for 2050 made by the HSBC according to this analysis we uh, it has been estimated by that by 2050 Mexico will be on the fifth or fourth place of the largest economies in the world the GDP per capita may be comparable to a developed country. According to the HBSBC, by 2050, this is the forecast for Mexico. This is how the automotive industry has behaved in, or behaved in 2014. Uh, top uh, uh, production com countries in the world, top vehicle pr production countries. Here you can see the same trend for 2015, and Mexico was ranked third on production increase since 2006. This means that from 2006 to 2014, we grew uh, by 14% and we became third on growth. In 2020, um, um, Dr. Eduardo Salis has mentioned this, the expected production for Mexico will be 5.1 million E vehicles or units and Mexico will become the third uh, producer or manufacturer and that trend will be preserved and these will be the 49% of growth compared with 2014. This is our panel. Pan our panel is called Mexico and the rest of the world and here you can see how for Mexico looks worldwide. Here on the table on the left, you can see the vehicle production worldwide. And you can see that the first manufacturer of Ford is the US with a, a 1.3 vehicles. The second place is China. The third one is Germany. And the fourth place is Ford Mexico. Ford Mexico is the uh, major producer with uh, the, the um, amount that the, with 400,000 units. And regarding uh, engines and transmissions, the trend is pretty similar. The first uh, place on production of powertrain parts is the United Kingdom with 1.7 million 
million pieces or parts and uh, of, of transmissions second place 1.3 million for the US third place is China and Mexico is fourth with 576,000 par uh, parts uh, uh, motors and powertrains and we're going to be uh, be able to escalate uh, to the third place because we have just uh, we're going to open a plant in Chihuahua to produce 700,000 engines a, a year more and another plant that will be launched next year in Irapuato to uh, be able to uh, produce 800,000 power train uh, or transmissions in in Ford, Mexico is the fourth place for the for powertrain transmissions. And the here you can see purchases in Mexico for Ford. And here you can see that Ford, Mexico is the second place on purchases worldwide within Ford Corporation for the automotive plants. We are the, uh, the, the basis of vendors in Mexico is the largest after the U.S. to supply uh, the Ford plants around the world. The, the vendors in Mexico export to the U.S. and in some cases to Europe and Asia as well. This is part of the competitive advantages we have mentioned. This has been mentioned before by other speakers. Our geographic location is uh, critical, it's privileged, and uh, we ha have a direct connection with the US, which is the second largest market in the world. We have entry from the Pacific Ocean and the um, Atlantic with a short um, to a trip from Asia, Europe, and South America. The network that I just showed is a network that we are currently using in Ford. Regarding exports, our uh, largest exports is from the U.S. Uh, from Mexico to the U.S. by railroads to any of our plants. This is a model that measures that uh, we export finished vehicles as uh, we have a short sea um, routes from the south coast to Jackson, Billy and Bart uh, Billy Barton, we are looking at other possibilities to export through the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of the states, and we want to uh, we export to Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia from our plants in Mexico. This is the distribution of our product in Mexico. As you can see, most the fiesta that is produced in Cuautitlan has the largest share of. 45% goes to the states, Fusion, 44% um, goes to the states, and the, the Lincoln, 99% goes to the United States. So what else is important and has had a very positive impact the, for exports and imports? We are certified with uh, Mexican government programs that guarantee uh, secu uh, se security in the supply chain, NEC. Since we are mainly exporters to the US, our assembly plants for engines and transmissions have the city path certif certification and uh, from the um, US government, from the Customs and Border Protection Agency. And we are also connected with the states with a PIP, which is a similar program from the Canadian government. What have we done since 2013? Well, this has been happening for a while. The wheel continues rolling, and it uh, started rolling faster after 
2013, after the crisis of the of 2009, in Mexico, as of 2013, we have grown dramatically. What has influenced on this growth? The ge uh, geographical location, that chain, the supply chain is more robust, more capable. The free trade agreements that we have that allow us to have an agile uh, commerce and a very uh, cost-efficient competitive uh, factor. Uh, so we are competing f against $3.1 uh, with China and 12 and Mexico has surpassed uh, Japan as the number one supplier of vehicles to the states from uh, 428 to 408, it has ro uh, grown more rapidly than Brazil in light vehicle production. And the trend is that we're going to continue growing more rapidly than Brazil by 2020. And we will achieve the figure that, um, with the figure that has been mentioned before, 5.1. A mil, a million vehicles in 2014, Mexico surpassed the production of light vehicles from Brazil figures, and Mexico will grow one out of four vehicles uh, used in the United States. In the United States, will be manufactured in Mexico. So, so what do we foresee? In the following five years, the industry will continue growing at the same pace. We are still getting large investments in the country. Some plants are being constructed, uh, and some plants are in progress. And there are some others we do not know uh, of, but, they, uh, but we will have new plants in the future. There is a uh, pressure of cost in commodities, such as steel and other items we need to continue preparing technical experts in engineering purchasing logistics and manufacturing to be able to con to have a sustainable growth in the automotive industry another important uh, factor is that the government has to align the government uh, uh, policies so more investment can be uh, created in Mexico. Another topic that has been addressed by other speakers is that we need to align academy and uh, new experts and talents with the, the uh, reality we are facing in the industry. Another point is that we need to be to have more competitive. Uh, you, we need to be more competitive in all the utilities that we use. What are the conclusions that I would like to provide from this topic? Well, we see that the manufacturing companies of vehicles, they have to continue advancing or, or moving forward in productivity. We have to take advantage of the technology of robotics, new digital tools where it makes business sense. And we need to have as a vision all the order to delivery process, taking into consideration all the chain vendors, manufacturing, distribution of finished products, everything related to logistics from the beginning to the end, to where the end user gets the product, we have to create a, lab a qualified labor force, technicians, experts, engineers in all areas, in all disciplines. This will be all. This will be our contribution to this um, conference. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael, and you really put um, Mexico in its global context there. So a very interesting presentation. Uh, being in automotive or automotive logistics in Mexico is for sure not just about Mexico. Definitely it's a lot about the United States, but it's very much about the rest of the world as well. And next up to hear a perspective from a logistics service provider, uh, someone who's been experienced in the industry at, uh, at a car maker, 
at a major, major logistics company and now in a more specialist logistics company. I'd like to welcome to the podium Robert Strain, Head of Global Automotive for Goodpack. Louis, thank you very much. I will be one of the only speakers in this afternoon's presentation to speak in, uh, in English. Um, while I did learn uh, Spanish in the state of Jalisco and Guadalajara, um, it's been many years and my, my lengua no funciona como antes. <laughs> Louis and I spoke about speaking and having diversity here in the panel. Um, I'm speaking as someone that's been in the automotive industry for many, many years and someone that has been uh, very accustomed to working in and out of Mexico. Mexico and the rest of the world is a very large topic, but I'd like to step back and, and look at why Mexico and the automotive industry is here. Mexico has been in the automotive industry since the beginning. It started the turn of the century, 1890s. The first vehicles were imported into Mexico in 1903. More importantly, the vision of the government establishing a, a highway uh, commission on how to grow, um, very innovative at that time. It started to attract investment from Europe prior to the United States coming into Mexico with automotive. Daimler and Renault coming in, followed 10 years later through uh, General Motors and Buick 1925, Ford came in to Mexico, and it took until the 1959, 1960s, where many people may not even remember the Ramirez Camionetas, still around, Mexico's first automotive national company. But as with many governments, they grew, they saw manufacturing in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s as a way to push social agendas, full employment, um, revenues. And I'm not speaking revenues for the private enterprise. I'm speaking revenues in terms of taxation, uh, over-controlling companies. And during this period, Mexico, like many other governments, imposed restrictions and their view of what automotive should be and at that time, many of the autom automotive OEMs left Mexico in spite of the tremendous start that they had at the very beginning of the industry. So, we are here, catch up here, because of a, re of a resurgence in manufacturing. That's really why we're here. It has filtered down an automotive, but gone are the days where OEMs are going halfway around the world to find low cost manufacturing and sourcing. Why? Mexico, is, we, we've talked about the location, geographic location, but it's not only that, it's the supply chain stability or the supply chain fluidity that we talked about earlier. The location in Mexico and the infrastructure is now offering manufacturing controls and stability of delivery, of visibility of the supply chain uh, versus coming from overseas. The government has been very, very good at identifying and investing through the Mexico National Infra Infrastructure Program fueling the nearshoring revolution that's going on today. Over $17 billion has been invested by the, by the government, not just for automotive, but that has attracted additional investments from all of the OEMs, some of here, uh, GM, Ford, Fiat, BMW, Volkswagen, there are more. Why are they doing it? Reduced risk, lower costs, and eliminating supply chain rates, waste. This is not low cost sourcing anymore. The, uh, the infrastructure has also been targeted to automotive, building industrial parks, 
manufacturing hubs, and having those connected to the transportation industry, very important, connecting them to the rail hubs, the ocean. And heaven forbid you have to uh, expedite material in the airports. All of that is what Mexico is now offering through their infrastructure. Now, there are challenges. It's a balance of what to import, what to localize. It's not solely uh, we can produce it cheapest. We talked about the productivity here. The productivity of the Mexican labor force is higher than productivity in other, in other nations. That coupled with value-added surface, surfaces, raw material, bringing in raw material, getting the subassembly, the high value-added parts here, that's very important. Free trade agreements, we talked about those as well. It all has created um, the environment that nearshoring is growing here, but there are challenges which to manage. The competition is against the old theory of low-cost sourcing. It's not just peace price. Logistics, purchasing costs need to come together. I will go one step further. It needs now to be integrated into transportation and packaging. The waste that you see through supply chain, transportation cost, poor truck utilization, rail utilization, ocean containers, shipping air, packaging and handling costs, something generally overlooked until it's too late, disposal costs, importing raw material in, how do you do that? Storage, do you want a lot of warehouses or do you want what you need? And it gives you the ability and flexibility to grow and damage. Parts coming in, or raw material coming in, value-added production, exporting parts out of Mexico, all of these things that can compete against a low-cost sourcing model, which is nothing more than the lowest piece price. Automotive packaging and supply chains are now becoming integrated. It's taken a while, but it's, it is there. Packaging in automotive for inbound productive material is estimated at 2 to 4% of that piece price. It's not myself, Price Waterhouse Coopers, who we heard from this morning, has value just within the NAFTA environment, Canada, United States, and Mexico, that packaging costs alone are approximately $2.5 billion. The total value is growing five to 10% a year because Mexico's automotive industry is growing themselves. The challenges within packaging, within this sub-segment of the supply chain, um, they're very typical. When I was at an OEM, dealt with them every single day. When I was at, with a logistics provider, dealt with them every day. And as a packaging supplier, we deal with them every day. You either have too few or too many. With the new programs growing, with the explosive growth within the new programs within Mexico, how do you take a packaging design for one program that's going to be used for another program and have them overlap? Visibility. While I was at an OEM, the largest issue was we didn't know where our containers were. They weren't tagged. They weren't tracked. Manufacturing said it was more important to track a part, but with today's tier suppliers' competencies, getting a high-quality part is easier than to keep track of containers. And without the container, your supply chain can break. The incorrect loop size. How many days does it take, whether it's by truck, rail, ocean? That assumption and then the packaging and racks required to support that assumption is generally wrong. 
maintenance of packaging? How do you repair your racks, where they are when they're re being repaired? All of this is additional complexity for the OEM and suppliers, depending on who owns the packaging. Many times the supplier owns, many times the OEM owns. A lot of capital is being invested into packaging in a fairly inefficient way at this time. International packaging. Are there solutions out there? Generally, international is all expendable. Domestic has moved ahead into returnable packaging solutions, but we have yet to come up with uh, widespread acceptance of international packing solutions. Well, the advantages are the same. International packaging solutions can assist create to create a supply chain efficiency that is required for the nearshoring and what Mexico is experiencing right now. You have to remain efficient on your supply chains. Returnable packaging is, uh, for an international environment is very similar to domestic. A packaging provider can own that fleet, make that investment on behalf of the automotive industry and others, allowing tiered suppliers and OEMs to take their, their CapEx, their capital expenditures, and invest in the proprietary nature of the business that they are, producing parts and producing vehicles. These suppliers can then generate efficiencies that compound on efficiencies that are, are, are scale and eliminate this investment in an outside non-core activity. Logistics savings has been, has been something that's pounded into the automotive logistics world for many years. It's been a topic here at the automotive logistics forums for quite some time. The three PLs out there, they know that the OEMs and the tiered suppliers are hammering away at their logistics price. Well, it's, it's multi-dimensional now because logistics and packaging can generate additional savings when put together. This is not just me saying this, this is Deloitte Automotive Group. By leveraging and reusing packaging for both a domestic and international, additional supply chain efficiencies are achieved. What are they? Rather than reading on the board, 15 to 25%. It's a big number. 15 to 25% of $2.5 billion being spent in NAFTA alone on packaging. The time has come to start having these discussions. It is waste. It's waste in the supply chain. And waste in the supply chain here in Mexico is a risk to the near-showing revolution that's going on right now. These wastes are generally not budgeted in a traditional logistics environment. They're not seen until it's too late. You run through all of the cash and the capex, and then you understand that we don't have the, the right amount of containers or racks that are required. We don't have the storage space at a warehouse anymore because our racks aren't designed to maximize the inventory that is being required. Expendable packaging sustainability is becoming very, very important. Getting rid of corrugate boxing material, whether it's corrugate, whether it's, it's wood, it's becoming very expensive and it's also viewed as a negative from a governmental standpoint. Damages. Happens all the time. My company rep has steel containers. We tell people that they can't be damaged. I see it all the time. Once containers and racks are damaged, then you get more pressure on the supply chain. Is the loop size correct? You have to go out and buy additional containers. Why do that? Why not use a container provider 
and pull from their inventories. And then there's where are the containers? One of the largest challenges of OEMs today, identifying where their containers are. I was used to having meetings three to four times a year to return containers that one OEM will have of the others. They may be colored differently, but they always end up at a supplier, and the supplier can mix them up. So those are some of the wastes that can be eliminated or certainly managed quite a bit tighter looking at returnable container solutions. Thank you very much. appreciate the offer. Thank you very much, sharing, uh, Robert, for sharing some of your experiences and focusing uh, a little bit more on the, on the packaging side, something that's very important uh, and something we'll be covering later on in the, in the conference as well. I wasn't aware that uh, Ford first came here in 1925 uh, when I think Rafael Lopez was just low down in the traffic, transportation management side. Rafael, you promised you would laugh if I said a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and applause. <it was. laughs> uh, so I think we had some, some very interesting presentations. They're sharing, again, a little bit of investment and what uh, a region is doing to, to, pro to promote automotive, perhaps particularly on the supply side. Uh, we've looked at what you know, is being done to support the logistics industry from associations and from the government, uh, a perspective from a car maker, on the global side of Mexico, and of course uh, from a logistics service provider giving us some insight into the Mexican automotive industry and some of the waste that are faced in our industry. We haven't got a lot of time, so I'd like to throw it straight out uh, to the audience for any questions or comments. Uh, the usual rules apply. Please raise your hand, wait for the microphone so we can hear you clearly. Uh, say your name and your company name. Uh, sing a song in Mexican first, and then we will accept your, your question. Okay, I was joking about the song, so you can ask the questions. <laughs> there is a question at the back, so right at the back row. Thank you. Hasta atrás. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Jorge Cedeño de Goodpack. Mm -hmm. Y tengo una pregunta para Rubén, del estado de Jalisco. Habías comentado... Jalisco. You were saying that you are trying to find investment from more companies in Jalisco, but you know, I visit Jalisco twice a month and I haven't found new companies there. So what strategy is Jalisco going to use to draw in investment? Because it's cheaper to send a trailer from Juarez to Toluca than from Juarez to Guadalajara. So what are you going to do in terms of costs? Thank you for the question. In the Lagos de Moreno Industrial Park that I talked about, we have 11 projects, uh, under, uh, ongoing projects. Well, one of them is finished for a German company already started with mass production two weeks ago. The other 10 projects are working they are starting to work there already. They are tier two and tier three suppliers. Among the 11, we have two tier ones. In the metropolitan area, we have Zoltik. It's a carbon fiber project. They have an interesting project because they want to turn a cluster in carbon fiber. They've worked in the automotive industry and now they are in the airspace, aerospatial sector. Lardup is a is a company from Taiwan. They're near the metropolitan area. They manufacture car lights. It's also a major company in Asia. They are well established in our region and they have companies both in, in also in Aguascalientes and 
the central region. We have a diff additional project like the Warner Hela ZF Zach Bowen. And even though Honda does have facilities in Jalisco, they are preparing investments in the area. Around the metropolitan area, we do have five other projects, but they're confidential now, so I cannot disclose information. But they have told us they're there because of skilled labor in the area. We do not have automotive facilities. Maybe we could have an OEM, but we have mainly focused on supply. Okay, uh, any other questions? There's a question in the, in the middle here. Gracias, me voy a levantar. Eh, mi nombre es Vicente Torres, soy de PTV Group. Esta es una pregunta. PTV Group. It's a question for everybody. We've heard impressing positive numbers about um, the Mexican position in the automotive market, and and we and you all talked about growth. Perhaps this is not the right time to pose this question. Perhaps I'm exaggerating, but you know. We all know there is a shift in the mobility paradigm. Things are happening in the world. We're trying to build economies that don't revolve around oil anymore. These things affect the automotive industry. So what is Mexico doing to tackle the mobility paradigm shift we are now facing? ¿Quién quiere responder esa pregunta primero? Bueno, la... la We do find pressure due to the current economic situation. So we find pressure in some commodities such as steel, plastics, raw materials. As automotive sector, we can avoid waste throughout the chain and throughout our processes. We need to clearly understand what can be controlled and what cannot be controlled. What can be controlled, well, our processes, we need to optimize our chain, operations, supply, but and about the the what you mentioned about living with, with an economy with that does not revolve around oil, there is not much we can do about it as automotive industry. We need to be as efficient as possible and we need to act wherever it is possible. Uh, for Jalisco, what are you doing to plan for the new mobility models where there's, you know, connected cars, uh, not so many cars in the streets? Uh, and also to Gaston, how do you think that will affect the logistics industry with these uh, autonomous cars and trucks and so on. But first to you. Bueno, sí resultó una pregunta muy interesante. It is an extremely interesting question, as a matter of fact. All states are working strongly in dealing with these issues because they're not future event we're talking about what is already happening now Jalisco is working to connect ourselves with the northern region there is a project of uh, Guadalajara Aguas Calientes new railway the train now comes from Manzanillo Guadalajara and it goes to Guadalajara, Celaya, and to the north of the country. A project is there. Costs are there. Rights of way are already there. So we can build this new train. So as a state, it will help us connect, allow uh, Tampico, Veracruz to the U.S. border because we have to focus on reducing time in the supply chain 
but if, but you know time reduction i believe that it is the most important part when it comes to highway infrastructure to road infrastructure we need to improve connection in the Lagos de Moreno area. There is a four-lane highway connecting Lagos de Moreno with León. León is a, a major city in the area. So some of the companies who are arriving are staying at Lagos de Moreno or they stay at León. This how highway provides for communication in just 20 minutes. Perhaps this does not pertain to us, but I did mention it, the Port of Manzanillo. We need to work on the Port of Manzanillo. There are a couple of projects out there in order to release or to provide relief to the Port of Manzanillo. Perhaps we can move to a port that is a ferry port that's not, that's underused, and we could improve traffic towards the northern area. We have requested a second lane at the Guadalajara International Airport. So freight forwarding is easier in the area. We do have products coming from Chile, such as berries, who go to the Guadalajara airport, and from them, from then they are sent to Asia. So S Sinaloa and Sonora are hubs that get products from Guadalajara and then they are sent to Europe, Asia. We know both the federal and state governments have financial, have budget constraints. Nevertheless, we do have projects to improve mobility, especially when talking about merchandise. It's an extremely interesting question, and it demands reflection right away. By 2050, we know that we will have one trillion people mostly living in cities. And it is not only a global issue, it is a specific issue that concerns Mexican cities urban and interurban logistics like at IMT we have analyzed our system and we know both aspects will interfere in companies logistical models and mobility um, within the cities we must all be aware of the fact that it is a system that is why we were talking about collective intelligence, because it means that we need to work together. Those deci decisions that are made by companies or by governments will end up affecting the system, which will improve or reduce competitiveness of the country or the region. That is why we need to enhance opportunities so we can work together to identify those products that may be moved jointly. We have the super chain cluster project which is tries to find efficiencies to uh, have scale economies in order to improve the efficiency of supply chains. This project requires user participation so it becomes feasible. Of course, I don't have an answer for you right now. But we do have technology available. We need to build upon that knowledge in order to deliver solutions. There has been progress, but we all need to be aware of the fact that if collaboration is attained, the NAFTA region will become increasingly competitive. There are interesting uh, 
projects in Canada, in Mexico, in the U.S., and we intend to continue just like that. Esta pregunta es... The Automotive Logistics Conferences, I recall it coming up in India as, as well as in Europe. I think from my perspective, um, with experiences with the transportation of 3PL and OEM and a packaging provider, um, we don't know where the market's going to be tomorrow, where it's going to go. This new technology of reducing the number of vehicles, automated vehicles, automated trucks, is certainly on the horizon. Putting a perspective of a tier one or an OEM, regardless of the number of trucks, the number of drivers, the number of cars out there, very important for municipalities, how they control their, their, their urban logistics, their rural logistics. Supply chain visibility, supply chain stability is what the customer is going to require. No matter if it's an automated car or truck, what's paramount to that supply chain is knowing where the parts are or knowing where the vehicles are, knowing their condition. And then the mode of communication is understood by all. Whether it's an RFID tag, whether it's a, a cell phone, knowing where that is is going to be very, very important and something that through these new technologies, they have to ensure that that supply chain stability, the supply chain fluidez is maintained and increases because it then will support the continual growth here in Mexico and other locations to be becoming more efficient because that is what the end consumer wants is a more efficient production and supply chain which will result in lower vehicles, lower cost for vehicles. Mm -hmm. I, would also, I would only like to add a comment uh, or, el or elaborate a little bit more on what Gaston just mentioned. We have to be more efficient and act where, the, where we can. A vision that we have is to have a cooperation among the different OEMs so that the logistics change may be more efficient. We t have talked about the transportation of finished vehicles inside Mexico. We have talked about the outlong of vehicles in Mexico. We have also talked about supply to our plants. So this is uh, breaking a paradigm and looking for new efficiencies and work team the, with those companies that also export uh, vehicles and we can become much more efficient. That's something that we cannot do by ourselves. We need uh, teamwork and we need to agree on plans and initiatives with other OEMs. That was a good question to finish on. I'm afraid we've run out of time now. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can carry on the conversations during the coffee break uh, or after the next session at the, at the dinner or tomorrow for breakfast or the coffee breaks and the lunches, etc. We've built in plenty of networking time. But I'd like to thank the panel for a very interesting session. Thank you. Please join us for coffee in the exhibition area. Visit some of the stands. They've got good gifts as well and prizes, so it's always worth a look. And uh, we'll be back here to start exactly at four o'clock. Thank you.